Hello, everyone, and welcome to Attitude Magazine's ADHD Experts broadcast. We hope everyone is staying safe and staying well. We are pleased to have Joel Nigg here today to talk about treatments for emotional dysregulation in adults and children. Before we get started, let me note a couple of housekeeping items. Those of you tuned into the live webinar may download the slides now by clicking on the event resources section of your webinar screen. And if you are interested in the certificate of attendance option, look for instructions in the email you'll receive around an hour after the live broadcast. For those of you listening in replay or podcast mode, you can visit attitudemag.com several hours after the webinar ends and search podcast 334 to access the slides and the webinar replay, as well as the certificate of attendance option. Uh, also, the sponsor of this week's Attitude webinar is Play Attention, Enhancing Brain Health and Performance. For over 25 years, Play Attention has been helping children and adults thrive and succeed. Their NASA-inspired technology and cognitive exercises improve executive function and self-regulation. Each program includes a lifetime membership and a personal executive function coach to customize your plan along the way. Call 800-788-6786 or click on the hyperlink uh, for their free eBooks on emotion regulation, executive function, impulse control, mindfulness, and more. Or you can visit their website at www.playattention.com. Use coupon code ADDMAG1020 to receive $200 off your Play Attention program. Attitude thanks our sponsors for supporting our webinars. Sponsor sponsorship has no influence on speaker selection or webinar content. Now for today's topic, controlling emotions. One of the most difficult challenges of ADHD is managing the intense emotions and moods that can hijack everyday life for children and adults alike. The inability to properly regulate feelings is a big problem for many people with ADHD. Standard treatments for ADHD only partially address emotional irregulation, yet there are proven and effective approaches to treat emotional dysregulation. And of course, they differ for children and adults. Dr. Nigg will key us into the latest research on the topic. Dr. Nigg is a clinical psychologist and a professor in the departments of psychiatry and behavioral sciences at Oregon Health and Science University. He directs the OHSU ADHD Re Research Program and is also director of the Division of Psychology. Dr. Nigg is the author of Getting Ahead of ADHD. You can ask questions of Dr. Nigg during his presentation, and we will try to get to as many of them as we can after he finishes. So all that being said, I'll turn it over to Dr. Nigg. Thanks so much for being here today. Happy to be here, Wayne. Thank you for having me, and hello, everybody. Um, I'm going to start out by briefly reviewing uh, why we're talking about emotion regulation and ADHD in the first place. I spent the entire webinar in July on this, and those that want more details on kind of the background of what the connection is and why there's a connection can, can see that webinar, but I'm going to briefly recap a couple of highlights. As many of you know that even though the, the um, symptoms of ADHD are, are officially inattention, hyperactivity, and impulsivity, and of course that involves uh, executive functioning and so on, the main complaint is often things about emotion anger problems, temper tantrums, and when we see children and adults in the clinic, this is often the leading edge problem. And when we talk to adults about what's the struggle in their life, it often may be something like my anger, my temper, people are telling me I'm overreacting, I'm oversensitive, or I can't cope. And people may get negative feedback on this. You're too emotional, you're so sensitive, uh, and so on. And this is what can we do about this? How does this often overlooked component in the official description of ADHD actually get addressed? Important to recognize that when there is an emotion issue, sometimes it really is a separate problem. The individual may actually be depressed or have an anxiety condition, 
or they may have been reacting to an ongoing traumatic situation or stressful event, for example, a child being bullied at school or an adult living with chronic pain, uh, or even in youth or adults, the onset of substance use or other change in life health. So it's important that from a clinical point of view, these be considered, and from a personal self-reflection point of view, that these be considered before assuming that it's only ADHD. That's partly why it's good to have a clinical consultation on these issues. One clue, but not the whole story, is whether this is a change from quote unquote baseline or normal for this child or for you, uh, or is this really who they are or who you are pretty much all the time, year after year? That's an important clue, but not the only clue to answering that question. And it's important to recognize, though, that people with ADHD have issues and problems and challenges with anger and emotional regulation and adjustment, even when they don't have another disorder or explanation. It can be part of and is part of ADHD itself as well. So this is a, one of the most difficult clinical difference, differentials is determining when there's an additional disorder there. And for the treatment point of view, we're going to get to this in a little bit whether you treat this as if there is an emotional condition, even if it's not diagnosable. I want to share a couple of key terms just to help you think in your own mind. We're going to talk later about the importance of differentiating internally, recognizing what's actually going on, because emotion is a big, vague term. And I want to begin to, to help us identify distinctions here that are very helpful in thinking about what do we do about the problem. One common term is irritability. This means inability to handle anger, uh, anger dysregulation, anger issues. We call it sometimes in the lay, lay conversation. For children, we call it excessive tantrums that are disproportionate to the situation. But it also includes a kind of grouchy, negative approach, even when, you're, even when there's not an anger outburst. Lability is a different thing. It's the frequent mood changes where I'm happy one minute, sad the next, angry the next, I go from crying to laughter easily. This might be normal in a, in a two-year-old. It's, it's, a, it's a challenge if adults or older children are, are extremely label, labile. Um, but it's related to uh, what's thought to be higher baseline emotional arousal, which is a feature for ADHD. Another factor here is the ability to accurately recognize others' emotions and our own emotions. One of the challenges for people with, for people with anger struggles is the tendency to overinterpret other events around them as hostile uh, when they aren't. And this is, has to do with accurately recognizing what, what's actually happening. This is an important part of, of um, working on this. And then a, a, a fourth issue for people with ADHD, uh, particularly adults, is that you're trying to, to regulate stronger emotions than other people. People with ADHD tend to feel very intense emotions, tend to be very passionate. And this means that the ability to self-regulate is a bigger challenge, even if your ability to regulate is just as good as the next person who doesn't have these issues. The fact that you feel these things so intensely raises a bigger challenge. And then emotional dysregulation kind of encompasses all of this. It's a global difficulty adapting. One can either say adapting to the situation so that it fits the situation appropriately, or adapting to what you want it to be. Typically, when I encounter adults with ADHD or ha who are struggling with their anger, they are displeased with their own behavior and their own reactions. They don't want to be this angry, so they're not reacting in the way they want to. And so it can be difficulty mapping your emotions to what you want, but it can also be difficulty adapting your emotions to what's appropriate based on social norms or your own values. A further complication for people with ADHD that therapies try to address, and we'll come to this in a minute, is the mixed internal signals. There's this concept of emotional coherence. And um, if you Google this, you will quickly be overwhelmed with all the magical solutions to emotional coherence that are out there. So be careful in <laughs> spending money on this, but do know that there is some physiological evidence for the issue of um, emotional coherence. And this comes from research, and I'll show you some data on this, uh, that the physiological signals from our body are not consistent with themselves. 
uh, you can think of emotions as the result of multiple signals. One metaphor that I liked is an orchestra with many instruments that should harmonize into a melody that tells me how I feel. And in fact, if you're getting all kinds of mixed signals from your body, then you're, you're going to be unsure how you feel, and that's going to lead to faulty responses. And so how does this link to motivations, goals, desires, and how does that all harmonize? And so an example just is that frustration and disappointment feel very similar, but they're very different uh, emotions. And one is the feeling of, let me pull back, and one is the feeling of, I'm going to go forward and, and overcome this. Anger and fear can also feel very similar. So can excitement and fear. So differentiating these internal states is one of the challenges for people with emotion regulation, dysregulation. This is just an example of the emotional coherence from some data. What you see on the, on the top there is a child whose facial expression shows intense emotionality, but whose physiological response in, 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 in cardiac response shows very low arousal. So there's not a, f a match of his physical signals to himself. He's feeling one instinct on his face and another in his body. So he doesn't know how he feels. Um, the second child is similar in the reverse. He's showing intense arousal in his physiological signal, um, and yet he's showing um, no facial response. And so he's going to have a hard time reconciling internally what he's feeling. So these are, are just crude examples, but we have quite a bit of data that actually shows that this is what happens in ADHD, and it depends on the situation. One kind of dysregulation may occur in avoiding the negative, and another kind of dysregulation may occur in overreacting to the positive. And so the, the challenge of correcting the emotional dysregulation may be specific to a negative situation that makes you feel negative or a positive situation that makes you feel excited or, or, or overly excited. There is a major overlap with ADHD. This is just some data on the frequency. It's quite striking. The number of individuals with um, ADHD who report problems or are able to be described as having difficulty with emotional dysregulation. It's not every single person with ADHD. I want to stress this, that some people with ADHD seem to have perfectly well-adjusted emotional reactions, and their problem really is pretty much purely in the domain of executive functioning and inattention, maybe with a little bit of impulsivity. But the majority seem to have, perhaps around 70% or 80% of people with ADHD seem to have notable difficulties managing emotions. So you're not alone if this is something you're seeing in yourself or in your child or in your family. <clears throat> The final piece to keep in mind for, for understanding why emotion regulation is challenging and why addressing it in therapy is challenging is that it includes both automatic and deliberate elements. It's not just my deliberate control of my emotions. It's not just about I got to control my emotions. That's, that's much more than that because there's all these physiological signals I mentioned, multiple of these from different parts of the body, gut, hormones, facial response, heart rate, breath. There's your automatic reactions and automatic interpretations, your cognitions, you just automatically interpret something as negative. There's socks on the floor because my family doesn't care what I think. Um, an automatic before you get to your deliberate reinterpretation or your deliberate thoughts about it. So recognizing that there's multiple levels here, it's helpful in thinking about how this has to be addressed and why it might be hard to do it just by deliberate effort alone. This fits with uh, what we know scientifically about how emotion works in the brain and the body. This, this just simplistic triangle is very common in the, in the scientific literature. And the bottom parts on approach and avoid are automatic brain functioning. And the top parts are the co conscious parts uh, in the part of prefrontal, prefrontal cortex. So just to say that this is kind of the scientific, one scientific model of how emotion works. All right, so let me focus the rest of the time on what can you do about it. Um, and some of the solutions and options that are out there. I'm going to try to hit this at a couple of levels. One is just overall principles, and this has to do with how you build what I will call emotional resilience that allows you to withstand challenges to your emotional stability or emotional regulation or being in the emotional state you want to be in. And that's, that's got some principles to it. Uh, and I'm going to, and I'll include in that some things about self-help and 
and what we know about that. And then I'm going to talk about what kind of professional help is available, because as Wayne mentioned in the introduction, the optimal way to get solutions professionally, whether it's medication or counseling, it's a little different if the target is emotional issues versus if it's just inattention. And it's also a little bit different depending on, on developmental stage, child, teenager, adult. Okay, so first of all, some key principles for how we build our resilience. One, the first one is overall health. If you're not eating well, not sleeping well, not exercising, these are going to make it a lot harder to feel good and to be resilient with emotional stressors or challenges. So look at what am I eating? Am I getting adequate sleep? Am I getting adequate exercise? And this relates to, to health in terms of drinking and alcohol and smoking as well. Um, none of these are helpful in terms of emotion regulation. Of course, they can also be helpful in the moment. They're just not helpful in the long run. And so uh, <clears throat> thinking about how those fit in. So the habits and the health habits are extremely important as a context here. And the first thing that I tell uh, families or adults working on this area is let's attend to the overall health framework first and then build on that because without that it's very hard to it's not impossible but it's harder to make progress so you can't get it perfect of course it's just a process but addressing any obvious issues here is important social support is critical to positive resilience when it comes to emotionality partly this means choosing for, for adults it means choosing social uh, relationships a bit more carefully recognizing those those people and relationships that are positive for me, that support me, that maybe um, can tolerate or don't dysregulate me, as well as those that are negative, that provoke me, that, that stir me up, that I can't cope with, and recognizing that I don't have to spend so much time necessarily. I can modify these relationships in these times. Not always easy in the workplace and so on, but can still there still are ways to think about that. And of course, in these days with our COVID situation, for a lot of people, isolation is a big challenge. Finding enough social support uh, is challenging and needing to make extra effort to make sure that you get those phone calls, those contacts with people that are supportive for you so you feel that resilience and that ability to, to self-accept, to self-forgive, to, to forgive and accept others and to move forward. For children, this is a reminder to parents of the need for children to get positive social support from you especially now when they can't always see their same number of friends because again because of isolation and in the parenting piece of this we'll talk a bit about the importance of of putting plenty of positive support to your children who are coping with this with emotional problems and anger in addition to the other other structured help that they need this fits in with stress management and recognizing that that if you have adhd often you feel more stressed out than other people by the same events People with ADHD tend to be very sensitive to stress. This can be quite a positive strength in terms of recognizing what's happening, but it can also be a negative in terms of quickly feeling overwhelmed and having difficulty coping. And so when I see a child having a tantrum, one thought that I have is this child cannot cope with this situation. They're overwhelmed and their coping skills have broken down. And so they need more coping skills and more support to prevent this tantrum in addition to maybe learning some alternative behaviors and other skills. For adults, it's a very similar thing. When, I, when I'm losing it, uh, losing my temper as an adult, but partly is a, sometimes there are times when it's appropriate to lose your temper, but I'm talking about times when that's not appropriate, not what you want to be doing. Then that means that you're having trouble coping with stressors and you either want to reduce the stress or improve the coping skills. So looking at where are my stressors, where are stressors that I can eliminate where are stressors that are chronic that I can't eliminate and how can I manage those differently? This is one thing that a counselor will want to talk to you about. And then don't forget about true traumatic adversity. Many people with ADHD have been through a lot of adversity in their life, and that's often contributed to their experience of ADHD and to their experience of emotional dysregulation. This is real. It's understandable. It's, it's normal when there's been a traumatic history to have difficulty with emotions because the body adapts to trauma, starts to expect trauma, but then it starts to see trauma where it isn't there. And that's where we get the overreactions and the difficulty adapting appropriately to the situation as it actually is. So an important part of, of recognizing the principle is recognizing, do I have a trauma in my life that's in the past that I haven't fully dealt with? 
or am I actually living in a pretty kind of traumatogenic or chronically traumatic situation now with a lot of conflict, a lot of hostility, and so on that that I need to get on top of and address head on and figure out. So, and this is true again for children, is this child dealing with a diverse situation? Maybe that there's a parent I haven't recognized in terms of family conflict or conflict with, with peers, uh, or in today's, again, today's reality, the child may be reacting to the stress that we're feeling as parents. If we're stressed out about the, the virus or about economics or about the election or, or any of the things that are stressful for so many people these days, then, my ch children may pick up on that and they're going to be more dysregulated. So recognizing, okay, wait a minute, where are the stressors and how do I reduce those? The second set of principles is how, how do we actually regulate emotions? How do we do that? Uh, I've mentioned some general principles around social support, stress reduction, and so on. But there's also internal uh, self-awareness steps that are interior. Uh, here's a few examples. There, there's a lot of these that counselors can work with you or your child on and that you can work with your children on uh, but these are just examples of what a counselor might bring up or but also self-help plans will bring these things up too that are effective anticipatory coping typically when when we lose it about something it's it's not something that has never happened before quite often it's something that's happening routinely and recurrently and that's part of why we find it so hard to bear it uh, it's a recurrent uh, hit to us so anticipating that's going to happen, okay, I know, I know that this individual is going to be difficult to interact with in this conversation at work, or I know that my child is going to throw a tantrum the next time I tell them, set a limit. Let me plan ahead to how I want to either escape that situation, exit it, take care of myself afterwards, or respond to it differently. So anticipatory coping, setting your mental framework ahead of time, not being so surprised. Self-talk and appraisals. My favorite example here is with driving and road rage. Um, you know, the, the car is tailgating me. Uh, is it because that person's a jerk? Or is it, and they need to be taught a lesson and I'm going to get all angry about it? Or is it because maybe they have an emergency and they're desperate to get to the hospital uh, or to get home because somebody at home had an accident? Maybe I should let them go by and say a little good thought for them of whatever they're dealing with. So you can really reframe these things. Um, uh, somebody's going too slow in front of me on the, on the road. Are, are they being passive aggressive? Or they just got a speeding ticket and they're scared to go any faster. You know, who knows? You know, so I think the reframing is very important. We, we have the thing with children where somebody bumps into me and, uh, you know, they're trying to start a fight. Well, maybe it was an accident. Maybe they didn't even mean to bump into you. So this self-talk, these appraisals can become conscious for adults and children, really make a difference in our interpretation of events. Shifting attention is a very helpful one for children. Obviously, we do this as parents with little babies and toddlers. Just move the attention somewhere else off of the – uh, upsetting thing, but we can even do this as adults too. take our thoughts off of what's upsetting us and calm ourselves down that way. There obviously, of course, is brute willpower as well, but we, we uh, have to use that once in a while. And then I've already mentioned social support, turning to somebody else for support. There's also the very positive, uh, positive action or activity. What activity can I do? Because sitting with the emotion is very hard. I don't mean blowing off steam. That's kind of a myth, but I do mean doing some positive action. Maybe I'm going to go for a walk. I'm going to get my exercise, or I'm going to go ahead and address the situation in a calm manner to try to resolve it after I've calmed down. Knowing that I'm going to do that might calm me down. So just this, these are the kind of things you can be thinking about as strategies that a counselor can work on or would work on with you. These things can be practiced. We can rehearse them to build resilience. We can practice emotional regulation by, by taking care of our health. Meditation, I'm going to mention some data on that, some data evidence that might be helpful in the right context for people, learning the meditation skills to be able to pull back, social support. So just kind of hitting these. And then as children get into adulthood or for adults who still have flexibility, those life niche choices are so important to get in a situation that, that works for you. So those are kind of overviews. Let me get into some specific types of intervention therapies that are available. Uh, and there are books on these things, but I'm going to give you the, the headlines on it, and then I'm going to get later to some things you can ask therapists uh, as well. Um, for children, behavioral counseling has the best evidence. This means parents being counseled on giving their children a different set of responses when they, when they have a problem with their emotion. 
building a context of positivity, a context of support for that child, and then in combination with that, a context where of learning so that they're learning that the tantrum doesn't have any payoff. Too often, the reason tantrums persist is that they work. They get the results that the person wants, so they keep doing it. These are headlines. I'm going to get into this in more depth in a minute. Medication is of limited use uh, for children um, and actually also for even more so for adults with, with emotional issues. Uh, so the counseling is really the strongest approach. Uh, and then there's some evidence for adults that mindfulness exercises can be helpful. And then there's a little bit of evidence for new nutrition interventions actually making a difference. With all what we know now about the gut-brain axis and gut-brain communication, there's increasing recognition that how we feel emotion has a lot to do with what's happening in our gut. If we haven't eaten well or don't feel well in our gut, that affects our feelings, and often we're not aware of that. It's entirely in the autonomic system. And so there's, there's interesting evidence emerging that improving nutrition, sometimes with supplementation, sometimes with diet changes, uh, uh, can really help the, the emotional reaction for children and adults. We don't yet know the proportion of ADHD that responds to this, but we certainly see striking anecdotal evidence. And now in clinical trials, a suggestion that a, that a proportion uh, can respond quite well to an improvement in nutrition. So that's a, that's, that could be a whole other webinar. I'm just going to note that because it's very new and the data are not yet conclusive. All right, so what uh, happens in counseling? What does counseling actually focus on? I'm going to start here with children. And this is a model I showed in the summer. I just want to focus your attention here um, on those. There's three areas of intervention for children here, three things that are believed to trigger their uh, tantrums. One is that they misperceive, so that upper box, they misperceive signals. Ambiguous signals are perceived negative, whether they're coming from family members or peers. A second area, the second box there in the middle, they can't handle frustration. They have, they have to learn to tolerate frustration and tolerate some delay. And then the third is the response that they get from the parent. If, if I, as a parent, am going to lose it and have a tantrum of my own, that's not going to help my child learn self-regulation. And so part of the challenge here, uh, and this happened to me yesterday, my, my um, little boy made an, a an action that just really provoked me, and I just really wanted to get even with him and get really mad. And I had to tell my wife, I'm going to just take a break and calm down here before I respond, because <laughs> I didn't want to um, uh, overreact and uh, give him an excessive punishment. And so... Um, Later, I was able to come back and, and make a plan for this. But this is, can be very challenging. Um, I knew that if I uh, lose it the way he's losing it, then I'm not going to be able to help him. And so this is, a, this is very important that we have strong, strong literature on this, strong data on this, that if, if we as parents can reduce our hostile and critical comments to our children and increase the warmth and support, then our limit setting will work and the child will improve. But... If we maintain too much hostile, negative uh, yelling or criticism of our kids, then our limits don't work and the uh, tantrums will continue. It's, it's just quite striking. Uh, and so this is an area for the behavioral counseling. A lot of the work will be on, um, you know, on kind of uh, how to help modify the parent response. This has a lot to do with planning the response so that you're not surprised and taken off guard by what is going to be pretty predictable. And with my... Uh, boy yesterday, I knew what he was going to do, but it got to me anyway. So it <laughs> doesn't always work, but that's, that's the idea. Um, I'm going to come to medication in a minute, but I'm going to stick a little bit more on, on the uh, counseling here for a minute. Um, a couple of our principles on counseling is to focus on one issue, one challenge that a lot of families get into, and we get into as adults also, with ourselves, is trying to solve everything at once, and we get ourselves overwhelmed all over again. So just maybe focus on one issue and let the other ones go for the beginning. So with the child, what's the thing that I, the one behavior I really want to work on with this child? Or for myself, what's the one situation I really want to work on and take care of before I try to solve all the others? So that means learning to accept and, and just put up with without concern some of the things that bother me and say, I know it bothers me. It's not time to deal with it yet. I'm going to let it go and come to it later. Now, there's limits, of course. There are things children do that just have to, they require a response. We can't let all of it go. But 
the priority should be on, on one issue. And this is important in counseling. What's the first thing we want to address? It's important, this is where counseling can be helpful. Is my child's behavior or my behavior really pretty typical of most people, not necessarily a problem? Or is it really extreme and re really harmful and I really should look at it? This is where a counselor can, an, an evaluation can help evaluate uh, where that line really is because I think people err in both directions here in my experience. Some come in and they have extreme negativity and they think this is normal because it's what they grew up with, so they're used to it. Others are afraid to ever get mad at their child and, and I have to tell them it's okay to get mad sometimes. Um, that's, sometimes that's what they need, but, but balance that out. And so kind of getting the, the right balance there. Um, and then I mentioned already the anticipating and I've emphasized and I will continue to emphasize the importance of identifying warmth and consistency toward the child and, and, uh, and avoiding the secondary gain from the tantrum. Uh, the warmth and consistency should not come right after a tantrum. It has to come at other times when there's a calm time to build that up and then avoiding the making sure that that tantrum doesn't inadvertently lead to a lot of comforting right afterwards or kind of a secondary gain. So it can get it can get to be require some analysis, but the overall principle is reducing the negativity, building up the positivity as a context so that the limit setting will, will be effective. What's the counselor going to do for the child? They're going to teach the child alternate interpretations. The same thing actually happens you know, to it for adults in counseling, helping them practice alternate interpretations of events that trigger them, whether at home or at school. Going to gradually help that child increase frustration tolerance. If they can't stand waiting uh, for 30 minutes, maybe they can gradually practice five minutes, seven minutes, 10 minutes, gradually build that up waiting for their satisfaction uh, or tolerating uh, a situation that they don't like. Uh, this also goes the other way for measuring success. It, it might be that I can't eliminate a tantrum right away, but I can reduce its duration, reduce its frequency. That's still progress. So we think about gradual progress here. And then for the parent, I think I've already noted these. The keys that the counselor will work on is avoiding inadvertently rewarding the tantrum and often it is being inadvertently rewarded. This is where the analysis helps. Avoiding having a tantrum yourself, always hard as a parent at times. And then planning a, a natural consequence that's gonna be effective limits and consequences and looking for ways to reward the positive. And then because these plans sound good in theory but almost always break down in practice until you troubleshoot the specifics, this is where it's really helpful to have a professional give some helpful advice and analysis of why it's breaking down. Um, it can be so difficult to to just read this or just see this and then go do it and say it didn't work. Well, when I see this in my uh, practice, it's usually pretty obvious to me as a therapist why it didn't work. And I can usually suggest, well, try this this way instead. And we can keep doing that, that fine tuning until it does work. As I mentioned, it doesn't I mean I always can do it for myself, but it's easier sometimes to throw the rope to somebody else in the water than to pull ourselves out. So. Um, this, this kind of thing can really be helpful. And I think the good counselors really can very effectively troubleshoot, and these plans can be quite effective at all ages. Although obviously they're a lot different for a preschooler versus a teenager. So there are two basic schools of thought on the approach for children. One is reward and consequence based. This is the most popular and well-studied method. And it's what I've pretty much been describing. There'll be consequences um, for the behavior we're trying to get rid of. There will be an alternative behavior advised and taught to the child that we want them to do. The, when they do the alternative behavior, they'll get something good, whether praise or points or stickers or whatever, depending on the child. Or if they're a teenager, maybe they'll get a privilege. Um, if, and if they can't do the alternative behavior, they'll withdraw a privilege or lose uh, the, the approval. Um, the second school of thought um, is reward-based where um, there really isn't much focus on c negative consequences for misbehavior, but it's really entirely focused on continue to just build up and reward the positive behavior until the negative behavior just kind of goes away on its own or gets outgrown. And the, the key, this is really very helpful when the challenge is a specific goal, like I can't get the child to get through his bedtime without a tantrum, or I can't get the child to get through his bathroom routine without a tantrum, or a meal without a tantrum. Then this kind of reward-based approach works really well. Um, because you can um, practice in a calm moment, practice the desired behavior, and then 
really give the plan the rewards or the praise or the privilege uh, for uh, any the, any progress toward it and gradually gradually increase it and then gradually withdraw the reward because you don't want this to be a, a, a bribery situation so you want this if there's any actual rewards to be t uh, short term until the child has learned and can do the behavior there's a third school of thought here I think I said there were two there's actually three that is problem solving based and some people think of this as kind of empowerment based where and it works really well if a child is very verbal or if you as a parent are very verbal and have a lot of ability to have a conversation about the problem as it's happening um, for some families this doesn't work for others it works very very well and there's a set of steps that are taught here around uh, identifying what is a child trying to accomplish by this behavior and since this behavior isn't working is there another behavior they could do that would help them achieve that that goal and helping that with the child arriving together at a behavior that would be acceptable to you that would also achieve their goal and this this has the advantage of empowering the child helping them to identify their own solutions it can be again quite valuable for a child it takes some skill and some training for the parent um, it doesn't have as much research behind it but the research so far is encouraging uh, so um, when you talk to your counselor you want to find out kind of what their what their approach is now for adults the counseling is a much more um, much less straightforward we have less evidence of what works for emotional coping for adults with ADHD um, I've listed here the most popular schools of thought cognitive behavioral therapy CBT uh, dialectical behavioral behavioral therapy DBT which is a mindfulness uh, based uh, CBT basically cognitive training psychoeducation and mindfulness based therapies and as you can see from the chart based on the, the literature the cognitive training alone the psychoeducation alone uh, don't work very well and the reason primarily is that they don't actually have you practicing what you're going to do uh, the mindfulness based therapies might work they make a lot of sense but they're not as well studied the cognitive behavioral therapy is really well studied for anxiety, depression, and emotional dysregulation with um, moderate effect size, meaning it's not as powerful as, say, some treatments for some conditions, but it does provide some benefit and some help. And there's quite a bit of work being done now on these mindfulness-based adaptations. I think they really are bridging the DBT and CBT type styles. And what we see, for example, in DBT is quality of life can improve, but not uh, other, other kinds of issues. So partly depends on the target problem. But you'll hear these terms as you look up therapists, you'll find out that they're doing CBT or DBT. And you may have to try one therapy to find out if it works for you. I've known people who have really liked one or another of these, these therapies and others who have really disliked and found them not helpful, despite what the literature might say. So there's also an individual piece to this but these are the schools of thought the most effective therapy is the cognitive behavioral and that's going to mean practicing ad adaptive coping strategies to help you with the emotional dysregulation practicing those in the office practicing them at home coming back troubleshooting just like we do with the child program troubleshooting what didn't work working on readapting your thought process your attributions as well as your behavioral response and thinking about each of those steps and developing kind of a menu of new responses for yourself can be quite helpful. The CBT, cognitive behavioral and DBT mindfulness, what do they actually do in their sessions? Well, um, the first thing they try to do is build resilience. They're just like with the children, they're gonna to try to build positivity into your life. They're gonna help you identify situations that are triggers and either predict them and plan for them or avoid them. They're going to help you work on your attentional control and your awareness of the, of the situation of yourself. They're going to help you work on your appraisals and judgments and then take different kinds of actions. These are kind of the components that are going to happen. And then afterwards, what, one of the things to recognize is these, when events happen that are dysregulating, they're very disturbing and there's, there's an after effect to tend to. So they're going to help you think about what's the after effect of the situation and how do you attend to that for yourself. There's another, uh, set of therapies I'm going to race through a little bit but kind of again modeled on the child piece there's an adult version called acceptance and commitment therapy that involves a lot of focus on self-compassion learning to accept and tolerate a great deal of the things that are really getting to me and recognizing that that some of these are just going to be this way for a while 
analyzing what can I do differently for myself, not trying to change other people, but changing myself in a constructive way, uh, identifying my goals and taking steps and making decisions to what I'm going to commit to doing for myself uh, while we're learning to accept and tolerate that the fact that I can't change other people and who they are. So this kind of approach has quite a bit of self-help element to it. There's self-help books on this approach that uh, Steve Hayes and others have published that I think many people have found helpful that have some data supporting them. And there's also therapists that will take this approach uh, that um, you may want to look into. I want to spend a minute on what to ask for in a counselor. Uh, these are some basic questions I would ask. You know, what model are you using? Uh, is it evidence-based if it's not cognitive behavioral? Uh, what would you be your approach with me, given what, what I've told you about myself? How much training or experience have you had using that approach? Um, or if you're a trainee yourself, how much training or experience has your supervisor had? Can I meet with your supervisor uh, to find that out? How will we know if this is working? How are we going to decide together, you and me as a, as a counselor and as the client? How will we know and when are we going to do that? And what will we do? What's plan B if this doesn't work? And then some practical pieces. Some people don't like a lot of homework, but a lot of these approaches rely on you practicing at home. And that's something to decide ahead of time if you're going to be able to do. I'm going to speed up a little bit because I'm running out of time, but I just want to say a couple words on medication. First of all, um, there is very little evidence that um, the traditional mood stabilizers uh, that work for depression and uh, bipolar disorder are very helpful for ADHD with mood dysregulation. Uh, stimulants are still the best single medication, but they only give a partial response, um, as is indicated here. Uh, the one interesting piece for very dysregulated children who have very severe tantrums is this recent publication just just um, a couple of months ago um, from an IMH that showed that combining uh, stimulant, uh, here in this case it's methylphenidate, which is Ritalin, with an SSRI, an antidepressant, uh, in this case it was Celexa, which is somewhat similar to Prozac or other Lexapro, things you may have heard of, that this was more beneficial than the stimulant alone for irritability. Uh, so this, I think, is a very hopeful finding that uh, the stimulant helps with the inattention symptoms, but only partially addresses the irritability and anger, whereas adding this, um, in this case, Tilipram, in this one trial is helpful. Uh, I think this is a very promising result, uh, and many people are hopeful based on this. We'd like to see a second trial show the same thing, but these were very severe children, and uh, we saw some, some notable benefit in these data. So for children, the medication is typically going to be start with stimulants, probably going to see only a partial response on the emotion side, it may be helpful to add an SSRI. In this case, Selex is the one we know about from the trial. Um, this is just a data slide for those that are interested uh, for adults showing that for stimulants like methylphenidate, we do see a benefit, but it's modest. The effect size of 0.3 is quite small. Note that for inattention symptoms, we've seen an effect size of about 1.0, so about three times as big as what you're seeing here for uh, emotion regulation problems. You can see for atomoxetine, even weaker evidence. So what we'd expect here then is that if you're an adult and you're going to take your stimulant for ADHD in attention, you'll see benefit for inattention symptoms in most cases, not always, but it's probably going to be a very slight effect on your emotional dysregulation all by itself. Some people may see a bigger effect. You can look at these big confidence intervals, but on average, it'll be a modest effect. So part of these, partly we're suffering here from limited data. Uh, this is really sh the same story. Again, these are some data slides for your reference later. Um, but we, we need more trials, and we have, do not have a trial in adults that combines the SSRI and the stimulant, like seems to have worked preliminary way with children. So the bottom line on medications uh, for children, I've already said, for adults, a second stimulant might give a slight benefit, but otherwise we're going to need to rely on the counseling support. Uh, mm -hmm. And then for finding a prescriber, it's good to get, a, I think, a consultation with a specialist uh, at, at one time before letting you have your PCP follow. These slides I'm going to have to leave for your review since I'm, I want to leave time for Q&A. The main take home here is that for most of these alternative treatments, there's still very weak evidence. A meditation training may be helpful. There is some value in some of these therapies on looking at the 
the kind of existential issues around self-forgiveness and meaning. And these are just the take-home points that, that summarize what I've said um, in terms of the, the best approaches. Uh, I think that's it. So I'm going to stop here, and we'll spend the rest of the time on discussion and questions. OK, great. That was excellent. Um, one question, do you have specific research that addresses perimenopausal and menopausal women who experience an increase in ADHD emotional dysregulation? That's a fascinating question. The short answer is no, uh, no specific research on this that I know of. The long answer is that there's a great deal of interest in the role of hormones for women in mood fluctuation, uh, both for adolescent women in terms of uh, cycling moods and symptoms around ADHD, and also for um, menopausal women around changes in their susceptibility to and response to different kinds of, of mental and emotional issues. Um, but as far as the specific question that you're asking, I don't know of any literature on that for adults. Um, and I'd have to do a little search to see if, we, if there's any even small studies. I know there's not a general large well-known finding on this. Um, but I do know that this question of women, especially women as they move through adulthood, is a real neglected area. So it's a really great question. Mm -hmm. Do you have any thoughts? I know you mentioned medication, but do you have any thoughts? And this has come up three times in the attendees' questions. Have any thoughts on taking clonidine or guanfacine to help with emotional regulation? It seems to have helped several of these people significantly. So yes, that, yes, that's right. The, these, uh, if these are adults, I can right. believe that that could be a good option um, for children. The guanfacine, in particular, I think uh, many clinicians think it can be useful although um, we don't have good trial data on that for the specific problem. But I think as the questioners imply, there certainly are clinicians who have seen success there. The clonidine is something that, that is usually, um, at least with children, a bit more of a last resort because it's a much more kind of heavy duty, risky medication for kids, but, um, but it, it can work. So I think, I think yes, that these, these are believable you know, experiences, that, that there is some uh, confirmation of that. Uh, it's not, these are not considered the, the main kind of frontline thing to try. Um, mm -hmm. This is kind of, I think, clinicians trying something else to see if it works and in a sense getting lucky. But, yeah. but on the other hand, I think there's mm -hmm. quite a bit of getting lucky happening and that uh, I'm going to be mm -hmm. eager to see some trials on this. Mm -hmm. uh, this is a, a parental question. My son refuses counseling because he feels that just going to therapy makes him feel like he's flawed. This parent is asking, how can I reframe this to get him to go? Yeah, that's a great, very common issue. Um, I'm guessing this child is probably a little bit older, uh, maybe approaching teenage years um, or even as a teenager. Um, is a common complaint from teenagers. Um, and it's, it's a common problem even for adults. You know, I don't like going to therapy because I just feel like something's wrong with me. Um, the, um, so the reframing, one reframing is that you're, you're getting a professional to consult with you on a life challenge, the same as we would talk to a lawyer or a real estate agent. If we had a challenge in that department, we talked to a mental health professional with a challenge in that department. So it's just part of normal life to consult a pro now and then to get tips on stuff and to get some skills. And so I talk about improving your toolbox of skills, looking at it as skill building rather than as repair of flaws in your character and, mm -hmm. um, you know, it's not that your character is flawed. It's that, you know, we want to build up some skills. And I think for children in particular, the reframing is that, look, I need to build up my skills too, as your parent. Um, we're going to in this together. You're not the only one who's going to get some more skills. Um, and the pro is going to give me advice too, probably even more than you, frankly. <laughs> and that's true. The, the <laughs> parent's probably going to have more to do than the child is. So I would try to reframe it as, you know, building up your toolbox for coping, uh, coping with challenges in life. You know, what we're seeing is you're having trouble coping. A lot of people have trouble coping different times. It's an opportunity. Uh, life is giving you to build up your skills so that later in life, when you have trouble coping, you'll be ready. So I would, I would see it as an opportunity for skill building to, to prepare for later in life uh, for a child. And I think for the adult, recognize that even if the child doesn't go, you can go. And it may make a difference. And the one case I remember what, that struck me on this was I had a, a, a Parents that are seeing that the 14-year-old refused to come in, 
they dragged him over there, and, and I told him he could sit outside in the hall if he didn't want to come in the room. But he knew we were talking about him, and so pretty soon he insisted on being in there uh, mm -hmm. to know what the heck we were talking about. Right. Um, and so gradually, you know, I think um, with the right kind of therapist, the child can be told, "You're welcome. You're, we're going to bring you along, but you're welcome to sit outside and read." We're going to be in there talking about what to do, but the problem, you're going to share the time with us, even if it's in the hallway. There's different ways you can approach it gradually, depending on the child. So I, I could go on, but I'll, I'll leave it there for now. Yeah, well, that's a good reframing. I like that. Um, what is the outlook for getting clinicians to understand that emotional dysregulation is a huge part of ADHD? I know that's an open-ended question, but I was just... Yeah, I... it's. <clears throat> there's, I think we have a general challenge of training uh, um, for clinicians around ADHD, um, at least in terms of, you know, when we look at surveys of primary clinicians, what we see is that they're familiar with what they're supposed to do, but they can't do it because they don't have the resources to do it. Um, and that they're not familiar, for the most part, with some of these more advanced issues, like what do you do about the emotional dysregulation side of things? Um, besides polypharmacy, which is not the first thing necessarily to do. Um, and I think this is partly an issue of education and training that has to happen over the next generation of clinicians. I will say on the other positive side that among the, the psychiatry, psychology community, the, the kind of specialist community, this is now becoming common knowledge that, that the, it's becoming such a big deal in the literature that I think for in the, in the domain of the, those who specialize in ADHD, Emotional dysregulation is now recognized as as something that has to be considered. It's just gotten, I think, uh, really emphasized by a lot of us here and gotten noticed. So I think it's it's a mixed outlook. I think the on the specialist side, of psychiatrist, psychologist, you're going to see pretty rapid recognition, and on the general practitioner, it's going to take a little longer because it's a retraining issue. Mm -hmm. A lot of questions about uh, misdiagnosis of ADHD and anger issues with bipolar disorder. I wondered if you might be able to set up the differences. Uh, some people are saying, uh, a lot of people said they've been misdiagnosed. Um, yeah, I believe, I believe it. Yeah. I mentioned in my, in my July talk, and you, the, this questioners might enjoy looking at that, I presented some data on that. It was quite a big problem uh, that hasn't totally gone away. Um, but the problem stems from the fact that in the DSM-4 criteria for, for bipolar illness, irritable mood and anger was seen as a mania symptom. And DSM-5 corrected that, but um, that hasn't always filtered down. And so there is a lot of misdiagnosis. The, the difference is that for mania, anger is not mania if it doesn't have other manic symptoms. And the manic symptoms are elevated expansive mood, no need for sleep, hyper um, hyper approach, so hypersexuality, hyper spending, uh, and grandiosity. Uh, so if you don't have that grandiosity, that elevation of greatness, you know, I'm the greatest, and you don't have that uh, energy burst that's away from baseline, away from normal, it's critical to recognize this is not your baseline state when you're having a manic episode. If it's chronic anger, irritability, it's not mania. And if it's a tantrum that lasts a few hours or even a day, it's not a manic episode if it doesn't last longer and have grandiosity with it. This has been um, taught wrong for, for, I think, a decade back in the 90s to a lot of professionals, and it's still working its way out of the system. So there is still a lot of misdiagnosis here, um, and it, it's, I think it's improving. I think the, the message is out there, but um, I'm sorry to hear that this has happened to people still. Mm -hmm. What about other comorbid conditions um, and how they might contribute to emotional dysregulation? Um, is there anything uh, that patients should know? Um, or go ahead. For yeah, for kids, the biggest one is um, depression, anxiety. Those are the two big ones, and then for everybody. Post-traumatic reactions are the third big one. So making sure there's not a trauma reaction here is the most common myth that I see clinically as the clinician forgets to evaluate past trauma or, or the self-evaluating adult uh, takes for granted the past trauma and doesn't make the connection uh, to their current struggles, thinks it's, it's history, it shouldn't bother me now, but it actually still does. Uh, <clears throat> for adults, the other piece that has been a controversial, which I thought at first was gonna be this last question, is borderline personality uh, has become a controversy for a lot of people and clinicians. Is this a problem with borderline personality? 
which has to do with um, also a lot of emotional, just is really another word for a lot of trouble coping with emotions and a lot of trouble coping with um, social rejection. And uh, the, the word borderline sounds pejorative and it comes from history, historical reasons, but it really doesn't describe the condition anymore. But um, so separating those two things is the challenge. Uh, the treatments though aren't that different for, um, if, if the clinician thinks you have borderline personality, the treatment for emotional dysregulation is still gonna be largely similar. Uh, there may be different medications tried, but um, I think the main problem there is if the stimulant, if the potential to treat ADHD with a stimulant is missed, that, that can be a real um, easy help that gets missed there. Mm -hmm. uh, what about, um, are there any apps or is there bio, I wanted to address biofeedback because that's been asked. Is that uh, are there any studies on that or the, the bi yeah the, the biofeedback the the neurofeedback where it's biofeedback with uh -huh. uh, neuro, uh, has, has been heavily studied now um, and I think you know I was part of a panel last year uh, for children now so it's been heavily studied for children let me say that mm -hmm. and what we now know is that it does bring a benefit but it's small so I showed you that benefit of 0.35 for stimulants. Mm -hmm. Uh, for children, the, the biofeedback is a benefit of about 0.15. Uh, so it's a small effect it, that may, again, average out to some kids getting a bigger benefit, some getting no benefit, but the overall average effect is quite small. So I would say that given the cost of it and the fact that it's less effective than other ways to, to invest, I typically will say, yes, the neurofeedback can bring some benefit, but probably about the same as regular exercise or a healthier diet would bring at a fraction of the health value. So I usually would advise people to go the other way on that, but because of the cost and the fact that it's not comprehensive for your body. But, um, but yes, it does bring some, some benefit. Um, for adults, I don't actually think we have a whole lot of literature on the, on the biofeedback, um, mm -hmm. actually, yeah. Okay. A couple parents have asked, with the proper tools and support, can children grow out of their emotional dysregulation? I mean, is it, is it a permanent part of your ADHD as you make it from, from childhood to adulthood? What I, what I think happens there is uh, two, two things. One, one, for some kids, the answer is a simple yes. They can grow out of it with the right kind of support. It becomes a childhood feature. Um, I think more commonly for people with ADHD that persists into adulthood, what will happen is they'll, they'll learn much more effective coping skills, so they'll remain passionate. They may even remain reactive, but they find a way, a location of life, a social circle, a um, vocation, where and a set of coping skills where it does not uh, impede them from achieving their life goals or having satisfying relationships. Um, but they need to may need to marry somebody who can deal with that <laughs> with them <laughs> they may need or who, or who actually helps them cope better um you know some people it, it really is a good balance others it, it makes it harder um mm -hmm. they need the right kind of social supports and coping skills and the right kind of vocational setting that isn't provo provocative for them so i think it kind of becomes a building forward where it yes i'm still a pretty sensitive person who feels things pretty strongly but now i know what's going on with myself and i can handle it um, one of the phrases that I like is I used to be anger. Now I have <laughs> anger. And so you get a little bit of distance from it. Yeah. So I think it's a partial hope there. Uh, I would say I want to give a hopeful message in that I think for some people, total recovery for others, partial, but for everybody, if you get the right kind of help, significant help. And that's, what's worth noting. Mm -hmm. That was great. I like that phrase. Uh, well, I think the hour is up. Thanks so much for being here. Um, once Pleasure. Again, was Thank you. Excellent perspective and practical tools as well. So thanks again, Dr. Nick. My, my pleasure. Thanks oh. very much, everybody. And thanks to all of the attendees for joining us. Please join us on December 2nd when Patty Catalano will talk about the many benefits of music, listening to it and playing it, and all the benefits on the ADHD brain. Um, sort of very interesting. Thanks everyone for being here and have a great day.